underneath the barrel, all those parts, then the trigger and the lower parts group, they all have to work together to give you that final product. But really what we're after is a finished weapon gun that shoots well. We are part of the NRA, people that are fighting for your rights. Uh, we become part of those groups. We would like to be to assist in the, in the fight for our rights here. Everybody sends in their memberships, and then they go to the lobbyists, and then they try to get the pro-gun bills through or try to stop the anti-weapon bills. Shoot it! You've got to pick your colors, and if you don't quite know what you want, we can help you get it exactly what you want for where you're headed. We just did one that looks like a snake, snake skin. Um, you don't have anybody looking out for you in Washington, so the NRA is supposed to be doing that for us. What is your emergency? Shooter, a shooter. Okay, okay is anybody injured? Yes, yes, a lot of blood. Please help, please. Okay, we're already starting the paramedics. Are you in a safe location? Please. Keep talking. I don't know. School, the school, the school. February 14th, 2018, Parkland, Florida. A 19-year-old student enters Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School armed with a legally purchased assault rifle. killer massacres 17 people, including 14 students. As you can imagine, it is a challenging, difficult morning. George is on the scene in Florida where another community is in disbelief, shocked by devastating violence. The most disturbing aspect about gun violence in America is that recent data shows that the frequency of mass shootings is only increasing over time. The students who survived the massacre are getting ready to go back to school and for a much bigger fight, taking on the NRA. In the United States, 350 mass killings occur each year, on average one per day. But Parkland may be one massacre too many. For the past year, all eyes have been on the powerful gun lobby, the NRA. The National Rifle Association's sole purpose is to defend the absolute right of citizens to own a firearm. To stop a bad guy with a gun. It takes a good guy with a gun. The National Rifle Association is one of the most powerful political forces in America. It has a simple message. We have a constitutional right to own firearms, and nobody can take that away from us. The NRA weaves its web of influence from the backwoods of the United States all the way to the White House. If you had a teacher with who was adept at firearms. They could very well end the attack very quickly. The lobby seems untouchable, non-bending. Its resources are unlimited, and its supporters resolute. There's over five million members uh, in the NRA today. Uh, they've gained more and more uh, power. Uh, a lot of the power, of course, is financial because they can support candidates uh, during elections. In Washington, we are the voice of the American gun owner. We are the voice of the Second Amendment. It's almost part of the American DNA. Uh, when you tell people that you're going to, well, now say we're going to abolish the Second Amendment, it's right, well, just good luck with that. How does the NRA manage to dictate the law in the United States? Who are these Americans willing to do anything to defend it? Since the Parkland Massacre, war has been declared between the organization and the young survivors who have become its most vocal opponents. But the NRA has taken up arms, 
determined not to yield an inch. Students from Parkland really coming out in force as a new political movement that we have never seen before, um, marching on Washington, um, lobbying their elected officials. They're going up against history that hasn't been on their side at the polls, and they're going up against a dedicated group of people uh, in the NRA that they fought this battle before. Um, as tragic as it is, the kids that are coming out of Parkland are, they're new to this political fight. And the NRA has been fighting, and gun rights advocates have been fighting this battle for a long time. To the west of Colorado, at the foot of the Rocky Mountains, sits a small town that still looks like something out of the Wild West. The town of Rifle is aptly named. Here, amid rows of perfectly aligned streets and red brick buildings, stands a rather unusual place that is the embodiment of pro-gun rural America. A saloon? Almost. The aptly named Shooter Grill restaurant, whose theme is openly displayed at the entrance. Guns are welcome on the premises. This is pretty new. Um, so I've had this one, um, gosh, maybe two months. I carried my uh, 43 for quite a while. Um, I really like that one, but then this one is a double stack, so I, I like that. And I know how to land it, so I don't need to jump out. 32-year-old <laughs> Lauren Bobert is the owner. That gives you the Hunter Burger. There you go, sir. Did like all the waitresses, she has a 9mm semi-automatic pistol slung around her waist. In a restaurant where John Wayne and collector's weapons sit side by side, and Jesus is surrounded by bullets, nothing is surprising. Shooter's Grill is an open carry restaurant. Uh, my wait staff and myself, we all carry firearms to work. And they are loaded, they are real, we all practice, we all train, we are efficient with our firearms, um, we practice safety with them. This is our menu, we have um, all beef Angus burgers, we have our rifle burger as a tribute to our town rifle in Colorado. We have the Glock 9, which is a reference to a Glock. Um, which I carry, a Glock 26. What do you want, Christy? I think that it's good for more people to have them because you feel safer. Um, this is the safest restaurant in the world. Everyone is always ready um, in case anything happened, and nothing ever has. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. What'd y'all get? Colorado is one of the 32 U.S. states where it's legal to openly carry a weapon, be it an ordinary pistol or a heavy duty firearm in keeping with the Constitution's Second Amendment. Ten. Awesome. To stop a bad guy with a gun, you need a good guy with a gun. Because the criminals have free range. They know you have nothing to stop them with. They can go in and try to rob you at gunpoint, and you're not going to shoot back because you are a law-abiding citizen, and you are obeying the government and not carrying your firearm. And so they know they could go in and they can have whatever they want. They could go in and take it. They could shoot whoever they want because there's no one stopping them. Here in Rifle, Colorado, there's people that are gonna stop them. For Lauren, who has always lived in Colorado, firearms are a way to protect her, her family, and her four children. She wears her gun at home all the time and has about 20 others hidden away for security. This right is conferred on her by the American Constitution and ardently defended by the NRA, an organization of which Lauren is a life member. This nigga's so cool. We, um, did, we draw the first, then we painted it. Um, yes. And I, I like that because there's a lot of Transparency. The NRA wants us to know what they're doing. They want us to know what they're fighting for, what gun control topic is on the table today, and they want to let us know how they're fighting for us. Along with Lauren, more than five million people across the United States are members of the NRA. In just a few years, the pro-arms organization has been ramped up. More money, more activists, intense lobbying for guns, with no compromises and no restrictions. Yet, 
Yet when it was founded in 1871, the NRA was just a hunting and shooting club founded by a couple of American Civil War soldiers. For a century, its objectives were to promote the practice of shooting and defend hunters. The National Rifle Association, commonly referred to as the NRA, is the oldest national organization of sportsmen in the United States. But everything changed in the 1960s. The NRA became a powerful political lobby, obsessed with gun defense. The organization was politicized and suddenly radicalized by a series of violent and deadly events. Now, Robert Kennedy has shared the fate of his brother, John. So soon after the death of Martin Luther King, this tragedy must bring Americans to their senses to legislate for federal control of firearms. One of the most important changes was with all of the violence in our society and other societies in the late 1960s and with the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy in 1968, President Johnson uh, began to push for more restrictions on guns. And many uh, Americans, even Democrats, who had supported Johnson became very worried because they were afraid that if they didn't have their guns, uh, they would be unprotected. When they saw, in particular, they were afraid of Black Power and Black, pa black Panthers. Effective crime control remains, in my judgment, effective gun control. The NRA felt the winds of change. There was a small group of members of the NRA that believed that uh, gun rights were about to be curtailed um, dramatically, and there were these conversations about gun rights, and they decided to rise up within the NRA, and they effectively took over the entire organization. It went from a moderate, um, less powerful group of sportsmen uh, to a very staunch conservative organization, 100% focused on the idea of ensuring that the right of an individual to own a gun would not be curtailed at all. To legitimize its struggle, the NRA cited the famous Second Amendment of the American Constitution. Written in 1787 by the Founding Fathers, it is today at the center of all debates. We believe in our country, we believe in our Bill of Rights, and we believe in our Second Amendment to the United States Constitution, all of our Second Amendment, because we believe in the freedom and the safety, and that it, and it alone, guarantees absolutely our freedom and our safety. The Second Amendment says, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And there's a lot of debate about what the Founding Fathers meant. Does it mean people have the right to join together to ensure that the government isn't um, acting as a dictatorship? Or does it mean every single person has the right to have a gun on them at all times, no matter where they are? There are two insights, though. The existence of the amendment shows that the founders assumed we would have guns. And the second is they assumed that there would be some limits, because it does not say in the way the First Amendment does, you can have free speech all the time. It does not say you have a right to guns in all places in the way we say you have a right to speak in all places. So they did expect there would be some limits. And so what we argue over in our society is what should those limits be? He hollered, the British are coming. Grab your guns, boys, and come running. What I think sometimes people miss is that when it was written, the weapons, um, the right to bear arms, those arms were muskets. They were uh, weapons that uh, maybe in a best case scenario you could get off three shots in a minute if you were an expert. Um, so at that time, mass shootings were impossible because there were not weapons that uh, would make someone capable. We start in Virginia, where hundreds demonstrated outside the NRA headquarters this afternoon. 
Protesters blame the National Rifle Association for helping to block gun control laws. This is one of several gun reform rallies Parkland students have participated in over the past few months, and they say the youth movement will not be going away. For the high school students rescued from Parkland High School, the road to reform is a long one. The NRA and its members are a tough bunch, and the Second Amendment seems unshakable. I made, I made, I painted it myself. At 19, Tyra Haymans witnessed murder firsthand in Parkland, where 17 of her classmates were shot dead just a year ago. We're in front of the cowardice ass building because that's where they all stay behind closed doors because if they had balls, they'd come and talk to us like people. They're cowards. Our fight is the winning fight because too many people have died and too much blood has shed. And when we say enough is enough, we damn sure mean it. Because we are tired of so many children having to wake up, look at their surroundings and realize, is this the day I die? It's not fair. In this state, this particular state, it says I'm permitted to open carry this as long as I'm not a felon, I'm not a criminal of some sort, which I am not. More people are beaten to death with baseball bats and are killed with something like this. So I would be more worried about that than me carrying this. Because I'm just minding my own business. They don't want my flowers now. They, they want their guns, but they don't want my flowers. But it's going to be long, but it's just about making sure that we're here with love and positivity to make sure that people know that what we're fighting for and what we're fighting for is just that more kids can survive high school and more kids can go on to grow up and do what they want in this world instead of fearing a bullet. In a country where more than one in three people are armed, some will dismiss these youngsters as dreamers or utopians. In the United States, more than 300 million firearms are in legal circulation. That's half of all civilian weapons in the entire world. Alan lives at the Colorado Mountains, and he's not about to down weapons just yet. He's a member of the NRA and likes nothing more than a large caliber gun. Let's put the dot on, that would be helpful, right? So I can hit some, so. That's me doubling the gun. Now if I put it on full auto, let's make sure my earplugs are completely seated. Now the gun's empty, same thing. You'll pull the mag releases the same on the semi-auto. You'll visually inspect it's empty, and that gun's clear. I grew up in a household where if I was a good kid and I did all my chores and I did what my parents asked me to do, I would actually get incented by them giving me ammunition to shoot my 22 caliber rifle. Honestly, the, the main thing I worry about is that someone is going to endanger myself or my family or my friends. And do I have the ability to protect myself and those I care about around me? Because unfortunately, as you very well know, wherever we are, even if we're in France, it's a big bad world out there. Every morning, Alan comes to the foot of the mountains to hone his shooting position, adjust his aim, and test new weapons. In his spare time, Alan is even a shooting instructor for the NRA. He paid $1,500 for his lifetime membership. Still doesn't like it. We need someone who defends our rights at that level. If we didn't have that group out there actively lobbying to protect our rights, who would we have? Honestly, it's how we earned our freedom from the British. I mean, it's, uh, if we didn't have the Second Amendment and we weren't armed, I don't know how we would have rebelled against the British to gain our own sovereign nation. It's just as important today because if we look at tyranny around the world today, when a government disarms the populace, and the government then does bad things to the populace, what does the populace have to do to respond? They don't have the tools or methodology. And again, that's the worst case scenario, and we hope never to be there. No one wants anything like that. But I think the understanding that people are armed and people 
are gonna protect themselves. It's working. These Americans then will do anything to protect the Second Amendment, and whoever gets in their way will be forced to pay a heavy price. Seven News, starting with breaking news within the last hour, State Senator John Morse concedes in his recall race. Tonight's historic vote leading to the first recall in state history. The National Rifle Association is attempting to coordinate the recall of a state legislator. He's being punished, as it goes, for passing gun restriction legislation in his state. In 2013, while serving as Speaker of the Colorado Senate, Democrat John Morse invoked the wrath of the NRA for the crime of daring to propose a law limiting the sales of heavy-duty assault rifles. The organization retaliated by initiating a popular referendum against him and securing his dismissal. In December of that same 2012, Newtown happened. And we had um, nearly two dozen people killed there, most of them six and seven year old children. So our session started in January, and I knew that we needed to do something about gun violence in Colorado since much of that violence had occurred here in Colorado. So by that time, the NRA had ginned up uh, support for its position. And so um, at one of the days when we heard these bills in the Senate, they surrounded the Capitol with about 20 cars that just drove around the block from about 8.30 in the morning until about midnight that night, just honking their horns, trying to disrupt the hearings. So um, the gun lobby did a great job of making it look like people were really opposed to these, ma these measures. Senate President John Morse is taking Colorado too far and in the wrong direction. Morse the NRA spent more than a million dollars in a brutal election and media campaign to dislodge John Morse from the Senate. Too extreme for Colorado. We call Morse September 10th, paid for by the National Rifle Association Committee to restore Coloradans' rights. This is pretty much their standard um, shtick, you know? I mean, they just lie, cheat, and steal, and for whatever reason, too many Americans buy into it, and as a result, too many Americans end up dead. Just pure lies all the way through, but you can see it's just marketing. I mean, there's very little that's very specific in there. You know, Morse is gonna give you less freedom. How is that even possible? After a career in the police and in politics, now 65, John Morse is a certified public accountant in Denver. From his hushed office, far from the Senate, year after year, he sees the NRA win over the American electorate. You know, my biggest disappointment in losing was that it sent a very clear message to elected officials around the country that if you do anything, even if it's just common sense gun safety, we took out the president of the Colorado State Senate, we can take you out too. And it has worked. Um, there hasn't been much in the way of gun law changes in the entire country since what we did. Uh, and we did barely anything. And the fact that it actually costs human lives and we're willing to pay that cost, I mean, it makes me ashamed, very ashamed, to be an American at this point in time. Back in 2013, when John Morris was relieved of his duties, David Keene was president of the NRA. Five years later, he accepts full responsibility for his role in an issue in which the stakes were sky high. We went, I went out there and lobbied against it, uh, as did every other gun organization in the Second Amendment. That was very important in that, in that whole battle that was going on uh, because you could almost hear state house doors all over the country closing, uh, where they were saying, oh, no, it's not 
something that we ought to be looking at because the fact is that there are consequences to to, take, to passing legislation that uh, that really riles up your constituency. It was political revenge and the demonstration that if you if you go against the Second Amendment, there's a price to be paid. The NRA, more powerful than the American political system, the bane of elected officials and candidates for high office. In Texas, a conservative state where support for the Second Amendment is high, resistance to the gun lobby is slowly becoming organized. A few weeks before the 2018 midterm elections, a debate on gun violence was held in Austin. Hey, I'm Steve. Nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. Former soldier and fierce opponent of the NRA, Stephen Kling is a local hero and the Democratic Party's candidate for the Senate. No, 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 I was one doing that. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, where's Chili? He's right he's here. here. He's here. Hey, buddy. Good to see you. Good to see you, buddy. Despite the pressure on elected officials from lobbyists, Kling made confrontation with the NRA, the pillar of his election campaign. Uh, kind of the NRA is really just a lobbying organization for the firearms industry. They make billions and billions of dollars in this, the United States, a very unique and open market to where nothing's traceable. Uh, that makes the United States, it's one reason the United States is the foremost exporter of weapons, both legally and illegally, and I would stress the latter. I care about moral clarity, and I care about making sure that we give a voice to the people that haven't had one. If the NRA wants to come in here and challenge me, I'll take that challenge any day. There's two halves to the Second Amendment. Alongside Stephen Kling are a former police officer, a victim, a survivor, municipal officials, and association chairmen, all of them committed to fighting the scourge of gun violence. In the United States, more than 36,000 people are killed every year by firearms. Two-thirds are suicides, one-third are homicides. In 2016, 120 kids under the age of 17 were killed and 175 were injured. Despite these tragedies, the federal law does not change in the United States. In most states, buying a weapon from a store is allowed at the age of 18, and the buyer never needs to demonstrate that he knows how to use it. To maintain a legislation that many consider too permissive, the NRA does not just put pressure on the nation's elected officials, it invests huge sums of money in election campaigns, spending millions of dollars trying to ensure that nothing changes. So this is a picture of the incumbent, uh, Senator Donna Campbell. She's chosen not to be here today. She felt like this wasn't a, uh, a friendly forum. We tried to give her assurances that we would be respectful and uh, that we would listen to all sides of this issue. Her position isn't really, well, she doesn't really have a position. She defers to the NRA for her position. Uh, and that, I think, is part of the problem, is they, there's their heavy-handed tactics when it comes to uh, our elections by pouring money into them. Uh, and overwhelming the other side of the argument with, with money, oftentimes foreign money, uh, is, is a big part of the problem and why our, legis our gun legislations don't reflect the popular will. The careers of some very high profile members of Congress have been boosted by NRA funding. spends a considerable amount of its resources in influencing our lawmakers in order to prevent them from passing or even proposing gun legislation. Foremost among them was John McCain, who received almost $8 million of NRA money, Senator Richard Burr, $7 million, and Roy Blunt, $4.5 million. In Florida, Marco Rubio got more than $3 million, not to mention Donald Trump, whose presidential campaign fund was boosted to the tune of 30 million by the NRA. You have a true friend and champion in the White House. No longer will federal agencies be coming after law-abiding gun owners.
More surprisingly, the NRA has established a scoring system for elected officials based on their dedication to the gun cause. School-like grades are attributed in the form of letters, and they have a powerful impact on elections. The NRA does rate uh, political candidates and elected officials on a scale that we rate our school children on. So A is good, F is bad, and all of the major candidates will get an NRA rating. What they often do is they take um, all the speeches that the, the person running for office has done, they have people that work for them at the NRA, and they scanned all of the speeches, and of course you can do this on computers as well, for any type of comments that might seem negative. And, uh, you know, just a few negative comments is enough to, you know, basically uh, push their button and they go after you. So, um, you know, typically if you want an A+, plus, you have to basically, you know, bow down to the NRA. You have to basically come out, in fr you know, in favor of the Second Amendment without any types of uh, restrictions. But I want to say at the outset that from the remarks you just heard, this is a guy that gets it. No, thank you, David. This is a guy that built and helped elect the kind of people that electrified this crowd today. You need great mechanics and you need great candidates. You need them both. Thank you very much. God bless you. We probably uh, endorse about 1,400 candidates uh, each year at, the, at various levels. If you have an incumbent who's an A-rated uh, office holder and a challenger who's A-rated, then the incumbent gets the advantage because his record is real because he didn't just talk, he or she didn't talk, they actually voted on it. That can influence people who aren't in that hard, that, that dedicated uh, group of NRA members because recent polling suggests that about like, out of all the Americans who don't own a gun, more than half of them say that they would think about owning a gun in the future. So when the NRA comes out and says, you know, don't vote for this candidate, because they're anti-gun, or vote for this candidate because they're pro-gun. They can send signals to people that even though they don't own guns, they might feel ambivalent about guns themselves. A few miles west of Austin, Texas, the very young learn how to handle firearms before they can even read. That's me shooting. Shooting. I see shooting when you were, that was your first time when you were four, right? Yes. First time shooting. Yeah, I shot the target. Uh, how old were you? Kate is six years old today. She already has her own rifle with telescopic sights. Her father has turned her into a real little sniper and a star of gun magazines. So depicted on the cover is Kate with her 22 caliber rifle. So this is the one that she shoots the most. That's what she kind of started with. Uh, it's easy for her to use it because it's very small and lightweight. And it fits her pretty well. I like to shoot it. It's fun shooting it. And it's pink. There's Kate with her ammunition for sale. Uh, ammunition stand, like a lemonade stand. Here she is with her rifle. She trains jujitsu and she does ballet and other things that help develop the strength that she would need to shoot heavier guns. This Sunday, no martial arts or dance classes for young Kate. She's out with friends firing off a few rounds in the Texan desert, where it's 40 degrees in the shade. With these kind of rifles, you want to have that nice and high in the little pocket of your shoulder, okay? So, so you don't want to have it down too low, you want to have it nice and high, okay? I'm ready to shoot, Dad. Uh, what's that, Kate? I'm ready to shoot, I got my aim on the target. Okay, so let's do the first one dry, okay? Down on the target, slack out, press. Okay, good, and one more. Down on the target, slack out, and press. Okay, nice work. Here, there's no minimum age for handling firearms. 
These children are between 6 and 12 years old. The smaller ones, like Kate, fire low recoil 22s. Although light and fast, they are still lethal weapons. Whoa. Okay, nice job, Kate. But he says the numbers out loud and I shoot it. Why do you like it? Because I like it because it's fun and I like using my gun. Good shot. Nice. Texans aged 7 to 77 defend the Second Amendment by brandishing this famous rifle, the AR-15. The gun is at the heart of the firearms debate, and using it has become almost a militant act. The AR-15 is not only the favorite rifle of little girls in Texas, it is above all the weapon of choice for mass murderers in the United States. Parkland and Pittsburgh in 2018, and then Las Vegas, Orlando, San Bernardino, Sandy Hook. On every occasion, dozens were killed by bullets fired from an AR-15. In the United States, 15 million of them are in circulation. The AR-15 has come to symbolize the war between the pro and anti-gun lobbies. Some states have age restrictions up to 21 to buy handguns, but not AR-15s. And so you can buy an AR-15 legally when you're 18, uh, again, all you can do, you don't have to show any ability to be able to use it. You don't have to show you know, any sort of real mental competency. You know, you, you, there's no waiting period to get one either. Walked out with an AR-15 and 100 rounds of ammunition 20 minutes later. That same guy, he can't go buy a six pack of beer. There is no better firearm to defend their homes against realistic threats than an AR-15 semi-automatic. It's easy to learn and easy to use. I think there are two reasons people find these attractive. Uh, one, it gives this sense of power. But second, uh, people are also afraid, well, if you limit that weapon, then you allow limits on other weapons too. So there is this purity, this sense that we have to have no limits at all, which is what the NRA argues. The NRA does not defend the AR-15 as the AR-15. They defend the right to own all guns. It's become a focus uh, in America now because people who want to enforce gun control say that there's really no reason for someone to have an AR-15. Uh, there's no good reason. It, they're not great for hunting. Um, it, it, what it really is purpose is to kill the maximum amount of things in the smallest amount of time. In total, the gun industry is estimated to have gifted between 19 million and 60 million dollars to the NRA. That's an estimate because there are no official figures. But in return for those donations, the gun industry gets a powerful defender in the NRA. The NRA is funded primarily by the arms industry, with members of the organization contributing annually. Like Aaron's company, many manufacturers donate some of their sales to the lobby. Far from concealing it, Ruger, for example, proudly spells out on its website that $2 is given to the NRA for every gun sold, with the aim of raising $4 million over two years. It helps explain the NRA's astronomical budget of $250 million a year, which is, of course, a great help when it comes to accessing the halls of Congress. So the obvious reason that manufacturers would give to the NRA is because the NRA drives sales. I mean, every time there was a, a shooting, um, people would buy more guns because they thought this is the one where they're going to start taking away our guns or they're going to start making it harder to buy guns. Um, and, and sounding that alarm was the NRA. The NRA was driving those sales. Um, and so it's no surprise that, that gun manufacturers and gun shops would have these arrangements where um, they, they give back a portion of the profits to the NRA. In exchange for donations from the industry, the NRA does everything in its power to promote gun sales, with around three million sold every year in the USA. But that's not all. Thanks to its influence on many elected representatives of Congress, it manages to have legislation voted in favor of its donors. In 2005, for example, Congress adopted the Protection Act relating to the arms trade, a law that absolves firearms manufacturers from any liability when their product is used to commit a crime. And the bill is passed. 
Pass amended. The NRA declared it to be the most important reform of the last 20 years. We lobbied Congress very heavily. Uh, we made it a priority. We judged people on the basis of their position on that. Uh, and ultimately, they agreed. Uh, and they supported it, uh, and uh, Republicans and Democrats alike. Uh, it was uh, very important to the firearms industry, and it was very important to American gun owners, and very important to the, to the survival of the Second Amendment as something real. What it has served to end up doing, really, is removing guns from the conversation. So it's now almost impossible to talk about guns in relation to any of these mass shootings. And you see that now today, sort of the, the chain reaction events of consequences, is that there was a commission stood up to uh, study school safety in the wake of Parkland. And last week, Betsy DeVos, who's the Secretary of Education, who's the head of the commission, announced that they weren't going to look at guns. They weren't going to talk about guns at all with regards to school safety. And she cited this act as part of it to say, well, you can't, you can't blame guns. See, you know, we have an act in Congress that says guns aren't the problem. User, It's this whole guns don't kill people, people kill people argument that, you know, it's just because it's a bad person who had a gun. The gun has nothing to do with it. And so the NRA really pushed it again to protect the manufacturers that are um, giving them money, that are supporting them. The NRA sets the agenda. It has made the gun a sacred, untouchable item. So the young opponents of the lobby struggle little by little. Like 60% of Americans, they want a framework for gun sales, a check on a buyer's criminal record, and a ban on the sale of assault rifles to anyone under the age of 21. Martin Benitez Torres. Shane Evan Thomason. Jonathan A. Kunwe Vega and Juan Paula Rivera Velasquez. Today in the Capitol, the leaders of the student movement, some of them Parkland survivors, proclaim their discontent in the vicinity of Congress. I am tired of politicians who shut down gun reform before actually sitting down and having this discussion. I am tired of NRA leadership, good Lord help them, mocking gun violence awareness and bashing young people who are changing the world. Marcel McClinton is one of the leaders of the NRA opposition movement. To challenge members of Congress, he organizes what these young people call a die-in a reconstruction of the massacre in Washington. So a die-in is just a mass of bodies so just you lay down and you make a mess so no one else can walk over you or cross where you're going. Um, and it's at the West Lawn of the Capitol building, which is a clear shot of the Capitol. They take so much money from the NRA. They don't care about what we believe. They only care about the money. And, and they speak on behalf of how many dollars they get um, and not on behalf of what we want, what we say that we want. So they're all sellouts. At his side is Tyra, the Parkland survivor. Since the tragedy, she has attended countless meetings, demonstrations, and speeches all over the country. It's impossible to forget what happened. I lost my best friends. Ever since that day, not being able to call your best friend the day of a shooting to talk to someone scarred me because it wasn't fair. We were three months away from graduating high school and just going to college just to be a regular American. But it took one person to change my life forever in a matter of six minutes. If it could take someone six minutes to, to change my life, it should take them two seconds to change the world. Change takes time, but for Marcel McClinton, whose life was rocked two years ago, this is just the beginning of the fight. Back to Texas. Every time he walks past this church in Houston, Marcel thinks back to the day he escaped a shootout when he was just 13 years old. Two years ago um, at my church, I mean, there was a shooter on, on the campus. Um, he was outside of the parking lot, and um, I mean, he killed, I think, just one person, but injured six. And I want to say he shot two police officers uh, with AR-15. The sounds don't get out of your head, and um, so that's, you know, what... At that time, again, I didn't get into gun reform activism. I didn't think anything of it. 
It's disgusting as a country, as we call ourselves the leading country in the world, and yet we kill most of our people. And I say we kill our people because our politicians are the ones doing nothing about it. And so there's blood on their hands, and yet they have the nerve, the audacity to say that, that we are the number one country in the world. I, don't, I, I think I'm proud to be an American. I love that I live here. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. But it's sad that as a country, we can't come together as one and say this is a problem. Let's fix it. Reforms are hard to achieve, especially in a pro-gun lobby stronghold like Texas. It's no coincidence that the NRA chose Dallas for its 2018 annual convention. 80,000 firearm fanatics gathered to back the lobby, along with guest of honor, Donald Trump. The president, in his element and totally uninhibited, showed his unstinting support for the NRA and argues for the carrying of weapons using the 2015 Paris attacks as justification. They were brutally killed by a small group of terrorists that had guns. They took their time and gunned them down one by one. Boom, come over here. Boom, come over here. Boom. But if one employee or just one patron had a gun, or if one person in this room had been there with a gun, aimed at the opposite direction, the terrorists would have fled or been shot. And it would have been a whole different story. I mean, right? In the short run, he's a very good president for the NRA because he does their bidding, he does what they want. In the long run, he's a terrible president for the NRA because he's a useful adversary to mobilize the other side, right? Uh, what the NRA really would like would be someone like George uh, W. Bush because George W. Bush is a gun owner, a gun user, but he's not so offensive to people on the other side. Don't worry about the NRA, they're on our side. You guys, half of you are so afraid of the NRA. There's nothing to be afraid of. I think the clearest example of how the, the NRA um, influences President Trump and the Trump administration um, is the fact that uh, you had the president sit down with members of Congress um, at that meeting at the White House that was televised, and you had you know the president sit with some of the victims from Parkland and from other shootings, um, and appear open to policy ideas that would specifically help reduce easy access to guns. We're going to be very strong on background checks. We'll be doing very strong background checks, very strong emphasis on the mental health of somebody. And then that evening, he had dinner with Wayne LaPierre and Chris Cox from the NRA. And we've never heard about any of these policy ideas ever again. Students at the Florida high school, that was the site of a mass shooting guard taking a road trip for change. Earlier, they boarded buses bound for Tallahassee. I'm here to tell you that this is no okay. About 20 students are going on a nationwide bus tour in their push for stricter gun laws. They'll stop in 75 different cities to take part in rallies and meet with voters and elected officials. who do not support a student's right to attend school without the fear of being gunned down will feel the power of our votes. Back to Florida, where it all started. Wow, Tyra so and her friends from Parkland have been on the road for two months. Since the killings, they have won some victories in their southern state. The minimum age to buy an AR-15 has been raised from 18 to 21, and Florida judges are now allowed to confiscate the weapons of anyone deemed potentially dangerous. For the young survivors, this is just the beginning of the fight. We have our 10-point policy, which is the CDC, saying that they need to understand that this is an epidemic that is happening, and it's crucial because they still don't believe that this is a problem in our society, so they have not made it a priority to let the public know that gun violence is a huge topic. That is what we've been doing. 
Second is the safe storage policy where we want parents to know that you gotta keep your gun safe and only the person who purchased the gun owner should know where your gun is because you're the one who walked into the store and purchased it and you're the one who walked out and you should be solely responsible and of course universal background checks and uh, there's a couple more but like those are just our main points in its push for change the parkland generation has at the very least had an impact on the debate in the united states exerting unprecedented pressure on the nra and the country's elected representatives Unfortunately, it isn't enough to get committed candidates like Stephen Kling elected, but the younger generation refuses to give up and promises to be the torchbearer for a less violent, less murderous America. They're able to keep up the call. They're able to mobilize people. They've become public figures. When I talk to people who aren't from America, they, they often ask me, you know, why don't you just get rid of them, why don't, why don't you um, make guns illegal? I try to remind people that there are so many guns. We have so many, hundreds of millions of guns in America. It's beginning to change because the way change happens in American society is we go into a part of the cycle and people see how bad it is and then they revolt the other way. This is the beginning of something and moving forward, we'll see that change. There is plenty that can be done short of banning guns that um, could happen in the future. It's just a question of, uh, you know, are we at an inflection point? Are we at a point where it actually is changing? Um, or is the NRA going to remain the powerful institution that it is?